we're coming fluoroscopy, and fluoroscopy, I believe, is in, I can't remember, I'm not going to lie, is it 28, chapter 28? No, it's a chapter, chapter 31, 32, 33, chapter 33, maybe? All right, chapter 33, that's where we're at. All right, so if you guys take a look at chapter 33, take a look at the key terms. Not a whole lot going on in those key terms, but they're very important key terms that you have to know. We got carriage, we got detector display, the Dell, we got fluoroscopic screen, fluoroscopy, flex gain. We got minification, pixel pitch, total brightness gain. So we're going to talk about those things. So let me tell you about fluoroscopy before we got to start writing things on the board. Fluoroscopy was actually probably the first type of x-ray imaging that was performed. And it was live x-ray. And what they did was they used a special screen that they painted with a special coating. And they x-rayed an image and they saw that there was an image that was caught, cast onto the screen. So fluoroscopy is considered to be live x-ray. It's dynamic, which means it's moving. Now, with fluoroscopy, we have two types of pieces of equipment that we work with. We have what's called a mobile fluoroscopic uh, system, and that's called the C-arm. If you've ever seen in the, uh, in the lab, there's this device that looks like this. All right, and this is the C-arm, <laughs> and then it's connected to uh, the uh, console here. There's a little handle here. There's an arm that's connected to it. All right, so there's a console right here. So this is called the C-arm, and this is the mobile fluoroscopic x-ray unit. And then there's a fixed x-ray fluoroscopic system as well that's built into the table. So here's your table. And inside, underneath, is your x-ray tube, and it, and it moves around. And above it, there's a screen that has some lead strips. And then there's something called an overhead carriage that looks like this. So this is a fixed unit, and that stays in the x-ray room. You can't see the x-ray tube because it's, it's underneath the table, but it's inside. And then above it is what we call the intensifier. So what we're going to discuss today are two different types of systems, but the main one we're going to focus on is the intensifier. So I'm going to break down the intensifier for you guys uh, today, and we'll talk more about fluoroscopic procedures, and I'll go into the math. There's a couple math problems that we're going to have to know, so I'll go over the math with you guys. So again, fluoroscopy is live imaging. It's dynamic. Some of the exams that we do are bearing swallows. We have the patient drink the barium, we watch it swallow, we watch it go, watch them swallow it, trying to see if it goes down to the esophagus, or if not, if it gets kicked out and goes into the trachea, that's bad, because it's aspiration pneumonia. Um, but uh, again, there's other procedures like ERCPs, when we're looking for the common bile duct, there is myelogram, where they're putting the needle into the spinal cord to aspirate cerebral spinal fluid, or to do like an epidural block or something. Uh, we do fluoroscopy. So there's all kinds of different uh, uh, exams that we do that we use for fluoro that we use during fluoro, but you know it just depends on what exactly they want to do. So one of the things I want to focus on with you right now is the image intensifying tube, and that's on page 450 and page 451. All right, so I'm going to give you guys the breakdown on the intensifying tube right now, and I'm going to go over the the basic components of that tube for you guys. All right, so. What we're going to talk about is the intensifier. <laughs> so I'm going to draw that C arm again. Looks like this here. X-ray tubes here. So what we're going to draw here is the, the intensifier, but I'm going to start with the X-ray tube. All right. So I'm going to draw this X-ray tube. And usually we draw it from the top, right, coming downward. But this time we're going to go upward. So you still have two components inside your x-ray tube. What's the negative charge component? Do you guys remember? If you said cathode, that's correct. What's your positive charge component? That's the anode, correct? So you still have x-ray production occurring here and it's still gonna be Bremsstrahlung or characteristic, it's still the same. So you're gonna have x-rays coming out here, just like this, here are your x-rays. They're gonna go ahead and go through the x-ray table, it's a special table. Then you're gonna have the patient so here's your patient, all right? Then the radiation is going to exit. 
and we call the exit or remnant radiation, correct? It's the leftover primary beam. You're still going to have some scatter, and believe it or not, the reason why the x-ray tube is on the bottom is because when the scatter is produced, you want the scatter going down towards the floor. That's why it's preferred that the x-ray tube is on the bottom versus putting the x-ray tube on top and the intensifier on the bottom. You want the scatter to go downward. Now, you as a tech, you still want to be at least six feet away from the fluoroscopic procedure if you can. All right. So, again, scatter is going to be reducing as it travels in distance. So the safest measure that you guys can do and practice as a tech, us, me as well, is going to be distance. And next quarter, you're going to hear something called the cardinal rule, and it's shielding time and distance. But it should actually be distance first because that's the most effective measure. You want to get away from the radiation. It doesn't matter if you're wearing a lead apron, right, and lead goggles. But if you're standing a foot away from the patient, right, you're going to get more exposure. Right? So we don't want that. So again... You want to stand away from the patient, and you want to be at a 90-degree angle from the patient. You want to be perpendicular to the patient. So if you're operating the C-arm, you're going to want to operate it uh, perpendicular to the patient. Okay? We'll talk more about that next quarter range protection. All right, so now the x-rays are going to go through the patient. We know this to be exit radiation or remnant. Then it's going to hit the intensifier tube. All right? So this is the intensifier tube. So... The intensifier, it's going to do just that. That means it's going to do what, you guys? What is it going to do? If you said intensify, that's exactly what it's doing. It's intensifying, right? So it's going to intensify. What's it intensifying? It's intensifying the x-ray energy. All right? So what we're going to do is we're going to work on the intensifier. And there's a picture on 451. All right? My picture will be very similar to it. All right? I'm going to draw this here. Make it a little bit bigger. All right. So take a look at this curve, you guys. This curve right here is called a concave curve. All right. When you go into the cave, it's called concave. When you're coming out, it's convex. All right. So this is called a concave curve. Now, when you have a concave curve, you might have some distortion. We'll talk about that a little bit here. So extra energy, here's the exit radiation coming from the patient. Patient's right here. You have radiation. You're going to hit. You're going to hit an envelope, right, a protective housing, but it's going to go through it, okay, right? so the protective housing on the outside, but the first layer of material that the radiation is going to hit is called the input phosphor. It's called the input phosphor. Now, the input phosphor is made up of cesium iodide, cesium iodide. Well, you guys know that we abbreviate everything, correct? So, we're going to have CSI. So cesium iodide is going to be the material that is going to go ahead and convert. It's going to convert x-rays. Does anybody remember what cesium iodide does? Because we talked about it in image production. Do you remember amorphous, uh, 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 what was it, not force? It was in indirect capture. That's right. Indirect capture, you had a material called cesium iodide. Now cesium iodide is going to glow. This was in indirect capture. And in DR systems, all right, this is one that I talked about, you guys, a while back. And we're going to talk about it again today when I do a video on uh, DR systems. It hits, right, x-rays hit the scintillator. It glows, produces light. Then it hits amorphous silicon. Do you guys remember that? So that same material that's found in indirect capture in DR systems is found here. And you're going to find cesium iodide is probably the most common scintillation material that is used out there in, in radiography. All right, so here I'm going to go ahead and draw a little x-rays, little x-rays like this. All right. So cesium iodide converts x-rays to visible light. All right. So these are actually light photons. All right. I'm going to draw them yellow. Okay. I don't, I'm not going to change to yellow. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> these x-rays get converted into light. So it hits the amorphous uh Sorry, not now for silicon. Cesium iodide, man, I'm tired of you. I, by the time Friday comes, you guys, I'm just tired, right? So no excuses. Cesium iodide is going to convert the x-rays to visible light. See here, it says convert x-rays to light. Then, then, I'm going to draw it red. The light 
the light is going to strike the photocathode. So the light strikes another device called the photocathode. So I'm drawing it red. The photocathode is going to emit electrons. All right, so it's going to emit electrons. So I'm going to write that down right here. So it hits the photocathode and emits electrons. So again, the photocathode is what's called a photoemissive device. And it emits electrons, almost like a cathode inside your X-ray. Excuse me, right? Got hiccups now. So when the electrons are traveling, they're going to be funneled. Okay, I'm going to draw a couple of these electrostatic lenses. I think in the drawing they only have two, but I, I got a couple more here. Okay, so these are called electrostatic lenses. Now, the electrostatic lenses have a negative charge. Why do you think they have a negative charge, everyone? Why do you think these electrostatic lenses have a negative charge? Guess what's going through here? Electrons. What type of charge do electrons have? They have a negative charge, correct? So what do we know about having two negatives, a negative and negative? What's, what's going to do? It's going to want to repel, correct? So when you have two negatives, you're going to have it repel. It's going to push up. And that's what you want. You don't want the electrostatic lenses to be positive because if electrons traveling, it's going to want to stick to it, right? So you know where that that, at, that positive device is going to be at? <laughs> it's going to be up here. And this positive device, what do you think we're going to call this positive device? We're going to call it an anode. All right, so we're going to call it an anode. So I'm going to go back to red. The electrons are going to meet at a point, and this is called the focal point. All right, they're going to converge. All right, they're coming up. Here, they don't really show it, but I'm going to draw it on mine. So that's called the focal point. Then they're going to go ahead and hit here, hit here, and then they're going to ricochet, and then they're going to be minimized. So look at the stream. Look at the stream. Look how wide it is here. Okay, so if this is the stream here on this side. Look how small the stream is up on top. So you start off as a wide stream, and then it's going to go ahead and get narrow. It's going to meet at a place called a focal point. Then they're going to cross, and they're going to bang off the anode, and they're going to become minimized here. So there's a process called minification. Minification. All right. So now these minimized electrons are gonna hit another device. I'm gonna make it purple. It's gonna hit another device. You know what, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it gold. There we go. No, I'm gonna make it gold. Let's see, I'll make it green. I know, I keep changing, huh? All right, so it's gonna be green right here. All right, there we go. So it's gonna hit another device, and this device here is called the output phosphor. So the output phosphor is going to convert the electrons back to light. But for every one photon that is converted to light in electrons, you're going to get 50 photons. So by the time it comes out here, the output phosphor converts those electrons back to visible light again. So then we end up with light. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to say it again. X-rays are exiting the patient. They're going to hit the cesium iodide. The cesium iodide is going to convert those X-rays into visible light. Then the visible light is going to hit a photocathode material. All right. If you look in your reading, I think it says that it's just coated with cesium. Not cesium iodide, but just cesium alone. Okay, so if you, if you guys look in the reading, <laughs> please do the reading. <laughs> you hear me say that all the time. You'd be surprised. I know there's people out not reading, but guess what? It's going to catch you at the end. So, again, you have to read now because if you don't, you might just barely get by, but then you'll be hurting at the end. So, again, 
do the work up front. You either got to do the work up front or the work in the back end. And I'll tell you right now, it works when you do it up front. So I shouldn't, I shouldn't be saying this. I should have students talk to you guys and say, to say this to you. All right, so you ready? X-rays are going to hit the input phosphor. The input phosphor is cesium iodide. It's going to convert the X-rays to visible light. Then the light is going to strike the photocathode. The photocathode converts the, converts the light into electrons. The electrons are attracted to the positive charged uh, anode, and then they're going to ricochet off the anode, and they're going to be focused on the output phosphor. The output phosphor, believe it or not, is only about one inch in diameter. So the output phosphor is only about one inch in diameter. What would that be in centimeters? How would you convert that one inch to centimeters? For every one inch, what's the conversion? You guys remember? It's going to be 2.54 centimeters. We need to know that number. It's going to be very important. It's 2.54. I know it kind of looks like one inch. 2.54 centimeters. All right. That looks better. <laughs> All right. So now you have electrons bouncing off the output phosphor and they become visible light. So now we have light here again. And again, for every one photon, you end up with 50 photons. Remember, photons are just bundles of energy. So this is the output phosphor. Okay. So there is math involved with this. So I'm going to stop right here and I'm going to go ahead and do a separate video on the math. But all of this is going to come back again. All right, but watch this video here. You got to know the process. All right, so study the process, write out the steps, write out the materials, and then we'll go ahead and do uh, a video just on the, the math.